Hi everyone, my name is Hans Ulrich Oberst. I'm the artistic director of the Serpentine Galleries. We are here in Kensington Gardens. We are uh, next to the Zaha Hadid building. Zaha Hadid designed our gallery here next to the garden of uh, Annabella Lennox Boyd. Uh, and we're gonna talk about design, art and architecture for us here at the Serpentine. It's very important to build bridges between the disciplines. We're also gonna talk about the future as a contemporary arts organization, as a Kunsthalle, we believe that we can only understand the forces which are effective in visual arts if we also look at what's happening in design, in architecture, and of course also in science, in literature, in many other disciplines, to break down silos and, and create contact, uh, different contacts. So this is gonna be the theme of today's talk. We decided for the 50th anniversary of the Serpentine to look to the next 50 years and invite 50 artists to actually develop a campaign uh, for the gallery and for the world, uh, which has to do with ecology, with the environment, or as Gustav Metzger would have said, who inspired this whole project to fight extinction. So one of the first projects we launched, and we're working together with, for example, Torquase Dyson, we're working together with Brian Eno, and a whole team of curators. But one of the first projects we actually launched uh, in this context was the project Create Art for Earth. And that is a project by Jane Fonda, Judy Chicago, and also Swoon. And these uh, three artists actually decided during the lockdown that they wanted to invite artists from all over the world in a participatory way. Judy Chicago, Jane Fonda, and Swoon say, make art, sing songs, create performances, recite poems, do this alone or with your families or any kind of material that is available to you. Share what you create via your communities and pathways, both known and unknown, to demonstrate the many ways that art can heal connect, transform, and make change. And you can find all of these more than 7,000 contributions by artists under the hashtag create art for Earth. So the focus on ecology, of course, means also that we have a curator of ecology with Lucia Pietro Justi in the institution, so this is not a one-off. We have a permanent uh, mission in that sense, a permanent focus on ecology ever since we worked with Gustav Metzger on the Extinction Marathon. And the same thing is also true for technology. We believe that in order to actually make technology uh, and science center stage in the organization, you know, museums need to develop new roles. So we spent week Vickers as the chief technology officer and the whole digital team, we created roles for that. And we started what we call the new experiments in art and technology. Um, the new experiments in art and technology is basically NEAT. Billy Kluver called it EAT and we call it NEAT, N-E-A-T, NEAT. And uh, these experiments are basically experiments with AR, with VR. We worked here uh, in the gallery with Hito Steyl, with Pierre Wieck, with Sandra Perry. Uh, but today I want to talk about Jakob Knut Stinson because he connects very much to Forma Phantasma. He connects very much to this idea of wood, to the idea of the forest, because actually Jacob created a work called Catharsis. Catharsis immerses audiences within a digital simulation of a reimagined old growth forest a forest that has developed undisturbed over hundreds of years. Based on fieldwork undertaken by Steenson and his primary collaborator, Matt McCorkle, the work's virtual ecosystem and also synchronized audio comprise 3D textures and also sounds gathered from several North American forests. Now this whole piece was actually set up as a single continuous shot that moves from the watery underground routes to the surveying viewpoints of the canopy. So Catharsis draws on Jacob's conception of slow media, whereby digital technologies can foster attention to the natural world and create new narratives about our ecological futures. Catharsis becomes a digital portal, a simulated journey that offers audiences access to past and present natural environments, slowed down and up close. And of course, the project followed also the Deep Listener, which Jacob had created as an augmented reality project in collaboration with Google and the Google Culture Project here in the park. Uh, so for the first time, we actually did an AR pavilion because we build every summer a physical pavilion, but this was the AR pavilion here at, uh, at the Serpentine. Of course, the project by Jakob Knut Stinson was part of the BTS Connect project by Dae Jung Lee. And we were very excited to participate in that because BTS collaborated with De Jong Lee with several institutions. And this brought together for the first time really the world of art, architecture, design, which we show here at the Serpentine, with the world of K-pop. Uh, BTS had a dialogue with Jacob P. 
Knut Steensen. And here, you know, basically at the moment of the press view uh, and had also conversations about this piece and it created an amazing crossing of audiences. So I think that's also very important because I think if you think about going beyond the silos of knowledge, I think it's important that we bring different worlds together. And for us, you know, the crossing, the bringing together actually of the world of art and the world of K-pop as it happened here with BTS was amazing. And we are also delighted that the collaboration with BTS now continues. Um, BTS uh, created a work for our Do It exhibition, an exhibition which I started in 1993, where artists are writing instructions, how-to manuals. So th the idea is basically that these recipes, instructions, manuals can be realized in many different ways. And uh, that the exhibition is in that sense open source. Everybody can just do it. And it has happened uh, nonstop really since 1993 for more than 27 years. Uh, we have um, more than 400 artists who participate and there are uh, always, you know, new basically participants joining. So when we did the project here with BTS, they joined the Do It project, Do It. Connect one dot with another. Draw a line, create a plane. Beyond the boundaries of time and space, you and I become we. Our future is a beautiful image. Now we realized that the Do It project, because of course during the lockdown, which started in March, this is a big change for museums. Uh, we couldn't uh, welcome visitors here. The gallery was closed from March to July, and we could only show again in August the South Bay exhibition, and now in September, October, the former Fantasma show. However, we did a lot of digital projects as many institutions during the lockdown, and of course, could show all these digital work, all these new experiments in art and technology we've been doing over the last couple of years. But we felt that it's important to go beyond the, the two dimensions of the screen, because it leads to a lot of passive consumption on the side of the viewer, and we really wanted to create something which goes beyond it. And we realized that during the lockdown, many people took out their old Dewey books, because the project has been around for such a long time, and they actually started to do it again. And there are so many possibilities. One can basically take a broom and make a, a fitting piece by Franz West. One can smile at someone one doesn't know, and that's the piece by Louis Bourgeois. So there's lots of possible you know, action points in this project. Or one can actually build a garden following the instruction by the artist and poet, Precious Okoyomon. So we decided with uh, the Serpentine, with ICI, with Caldor Projects, to actually relaunch Do It. There is also a site on the Google Culture Project and uh, commission new Do It projects for the period of the lockdown. It's not only about going beyond the, the screen, it is of course also going beyond the walls of the museum. It's an exhibition which in that sense enters society. It's about art entering society. And that was a big inspiration I got from Edouard Glissant, who was my mentor and teacher, the amazing philosopher, thinker, public intellectual from Martinique, whom I met in Paris, where he lived towards the end of his life. And Glissant is so important, and I'm sorry that there are not more translations. Most of his books, of his dozens of books, only exist in, in French still, and I'm, you know, I'm reading him every morning. It's a ritual. Also, this morning when I wake up, I read Glissant for 15 minutes. And uh, I hope that there are going to be more translation into English, into Korean, and into many other languages. Now, Glissant is so important for several reasons. First of all, we're living in a world of globalization. This is not the first time the world experiences globalization, but it is certainly one of the most extreme, maybe most violent forms of globalization, fooled by technology. And Glissant said that this will lead uh, to homogenizing forces which, which will destroy many things, destroy the planet, destroy the environment, lead to the disappearance of species, but also lead to the disappearance of cultural phenomena, such as languages, or as a matter of fact, also handwriting, which is why I devote or dedicate my, my Instagram to you know, a, a celebration and a saving, maybe, also of, um, of handwriting. So Glissant said we need to resist these homogenizing forces of globalization. He said at the same time, at the same time we need to resist also the counter-reaction. He, early on, in a very premonitory way, saw a counter-reaction come, where he says there's going to be a counter-reaction of new localisms, of new nationalisms, of a lack of solidarity. And he says that needs to be resisted as well, vehemently. We need to basically create what he called mondialité, a global dialogue which is uh, listening, a global dialogue which is not you know, basically homogenizing. Uh, and I think that's what we can do with exhibitions every day. And it's why it's so important for me to read every morning Edouard Glissant, right? Because I can think about how I can make in a small way a contribution 
to this idea of, uh, of mondialité, and I never want to forget that, so I return to Glissant all the time. Glissant was also the inspiration for an exhibition I curated this summer. Again, it was prepared during the lockdown, an exhibition called It's Urgent. And in a similar way to the Serpentine Do It project with ICI, with Caldor, with Google, the um, It's Urgent project, which is a co uh, collaboration with Maya Hoffman's Luma Foundation, actually um, was again a project which sort of went beyond the museum. We invited more than 100 artists to do a poster about what they think in our time is urgent. So that involves architects, designers, artists, and they all you know, had carte blanche to do with the space of the poster, whatever they wanted, and actually to address, in a way, an issue of our time they felt important. And so the project grew over the summer. We now have actually more than 160 posters, and these posters, of course, can happen as an exhibition. They can go into the city. We also had them as takeaways, and of course now, with uh, the uh, idea of not touching things in exhibitions, um, we also have the possibility that actually visitors can download them. And I think that's, of course, a big change in our world of exhibitions is that actually during this COVID crisis, um, uh, interaction or participation has to happen in a different way because visitors, you know, it's not possible to touch things. So we, for example, had to change the South Way exhibition here from VR to AR because, of course, with virtual reality, you need the goggles. And uh, that is not possible in, the, in this moment in time. And for this very reason, we then, together with Acute, the, um, the South Way exhibition is a collaboration with Acute, transformed the exhibition from, AR, from VR to AR, and everybody could actually see uh, this sort of AR component on their phone. I've talked about the, the aspect of ecology at the Serpentine. I've talked about the new experiments in art and technology. There is also the civic curation. Again, it's a new role. In a way, that's the role of the civic curator. That's Amar Kalas at the Serpentine. And I want to talk about one project which is just now being realized, which is the Radio Ballads, which is a collaboration with Barking Dagenham. The Radio Ballads are part of the New Town Culture. Uh, it's a Cultural Impact Award winning project, and it's part of the London Borough of Culture. It's a Mayor of London initiative. And it is actually a workshop, it's an exhibition, it's a radio broadcast. It revisits this series on the BBC of Radio Ballads from 57 to 64, which gave a view on the working lives of British people. So we invited artists, uh, Sonia Boyce, Rory Pilgrim, Ilona Sega, and Helen Kamok to spend time in Barking Dagenham to have residencies and to develop with the Serpentine and in close collaboration, of course, with the community of Barking Dagenham, these Radio Ballads. What that also tells you, and I think that's the same also for, for Back to Earth is that it's a different time frame. It's slower programming. I think if we really want to think about sustainable curation, if we want to think about exhibitions of art, design, architecture to come back to this idea of the next 10 years, I think it's important that we think about slower programming, that we think about exhibitions. I mean, we're here in the garden of Annabella Lennox Boyd. Who she has created that parallel to uh, the building of Zaha Hadid, and of course the garden grows slow, it grows over time. So I think we can take that as a model for the future of exhibitions. I think we need to get out of this idea of event culture. And it's not a coincidence that over the last, I would say, couple of weeks, several artists, including actually Otto Bong Nakanga, also Inka Shonibare, they've all told me that they want to start a farm as an artistic project. So that again, of course, has to do with uh, a different form of rhythm and a different form of time. So I think we need to reconsider the time frames of such projects. And uh, Barking Dagenham project, the Radio Ballad project, is a project you know, which evolves over, over several years. The same thing is also true for our pavilion, which for the first time is a two-year scheme now. We build a pavilion every year. And again, this has to do with the idea of democratizing of art and architecture and design, because we believe in this idea that we actually, rather than to just bring visitors to our exhibition that we need to go to the visitors. And that's, of course, the pavilion project. We do public sculpture also, but we have every year a pavilion, which we commission from an architect. It's a, pr it's a project which started in 2000 uh, with the pavilion of Zaha Hadid. And uh, actually, last year, we had the pavilion of uh, Yunya Ishigami, the Japanese architect. The year before, Frida Escobedo from Mexico. The year before, Francis Kire, who is between Burkina Faso and Berlin. 
So we also started to go into a younger generation of architects. And it's very much connected to Glissant's idea, because the other day, you know, somebody stopped me early one morning. I was on my way to the office. He assumed, because it was so early in the morning, that you know, I wouldn't visit the gallery, but I would work there. So I said, indeed, I'm working there. And he wanted to tell us the story of his daughter, because they came to the park um, previous summer, and all of a sudden, the, the daughter ran into the pavilion. And he said they would never visit the museum, but, but uh, obviously the daughter just ran into it. And she had some form of revelation. And she now wants to become an architect and uh, is reading all these architecture books. And so he said he wanted to thank us for you know, creating this vocation, maybe, or helping her to find her vocation. And he said this would never have happened, you know, because if it would have been inside, because they would never go to a museum because they, and I, I said, why? Because he said, they just not, you know, it's not part of what they do, but uh, because it was in the park and also it has no doors, um, they could have this encounter, you see. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to create interfaces, situation where many people who necessarily would not encounter art can have this experience. Um, and the pavilions do that. They're there for everyone. They basically, again, have free admission. Free admission is our mantra. We have free admissions of all our programs for more than a million people a year. But at the same time, also, they are experiments every year, architectural experiments, where the architect can really develop a temporary space. And of course, because it's not the permanent architecture, it's possible to do things one could never do with a permanent building, right? It allows, that's why pavilions are a kind of a laboratory, one can say, of, uh, of architecture. The most recent architects we invited are Counterspace from South Africa. The pavilion, of course, can also be used very freely in many different ways. There isn't a prescribed way of using it. So for example, when we had the Sejima Pavilion, it became a place for joggers, you know, to actually find their route in this, uh, mirrored in this mirrored labyrinth. When we had the Frank Gehry Pavilion, it became a place for stretching, for people who walk in the park. It's of course also always used for people to gather, to have meetings. So there isn't a prescribed use. And you know, some people see it as an experiment in architecture, and for some people, it's just functional. And I think this idea of something having multiple use, uh, of being you know, basically an exhibition, an experiment in architecture, but also functional, is, I think, very important. The multiple codes or the multiple use of something. And that leads us also to what the artist Ku Shong Ah does with her skate park parks. They use phosphorescent lights. Um, and at night, they basically they capture the, the light during the day, and they are uh, you know, basically illuminating themselves, you can say, through the phosphorescent light at night. But of course, they can also be used by skateboarders. And that's exactly what happened when she did it at the Triennale in Milano, now in Seoul, before that also in Sao Paulo, in Liverpool. Um, it's on the one hand an artwork, which is visited by, by people who, who want to visit the exhibition, who want to visit the work. And yet at the same time, for the skateboarders, it's a fabulous skate park where they can basically. So, so this idea of, of multiple use is something which we observe here every summer and leads to many different encounters in the park, you know, with the pavilion. And I wanted to actually end this talk for the Herald Design Forum with Etel Adnan. Etel Adnan is now in her mid-90s. She is, as every year, a candidate for the Nobel Prize in Literature, uh, one of the great poets and writers of our time. She has written with Sid Marie Rose, the ultimate book about the civil war in Lebanon. But she has also created extraordinary artworks. She's a painter, she makes drawings, She's a filmmaker. And when I met her uh, for the first time, probably 10 years ago, I asked her about her unrealized project. And that is something I always do. I ask artists about their unrealized projects. Uh, because I think we know a lot about architects' unrealized projects. We know very little about artists' unrealized projects. And she told me that her dream is to do more public art, to go towards the people, and to actually do architecture, and that she wanted when she was young, when she started to become an architect. But at that time, for her as a woman in the 50s, it was not possible to become an architect. So it is her unrealized project to become an architect. She has still this dream, actually, uh, to do a house. She designed a very beautiful project of a house and hopes to find a place where she can build that house. And when I ask her why she wants to actually go with her art towards the people, she told me the following sentence, which I want to read here as a conclusion of this talk. The word needs togetherness, not separation. Love, not suspicion. A common future, not isolation. That's the quote by Etel Adnan. Thank you all so much for being here, and uh, I hope to see you soon.